Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. Welcome to a very special program. I say that sometimes, but it's never been more relevant or accurate than it is right now. It is my honor to once again uh, welcome. Last time we were in our studio, this time he's joining us remotely. This is the great Eric LeGrand, number 52, motivational speaker, sports analyst, philanthropist, entrepreneur, um, and all around amazing young man. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing awesome, Steve. How are you? I'm doing all right. Hey, listen, do you remember the interview we did more than a few years back, several years after uh, your injury back on October 16th of 2010? Do you remember the interview we did in the studio? I do. I remember coming up to the studio up there in North Jersey and coming in there, just sitting down, doing an interview with you. I don't know if I, I was younger. I had a lot more hair back then, too. No, no, you're looking <laughs> good. You're looking trim, I could tell. You're taking care of yourself. But the other thing I remember is that I remember telling people after that um, that it was one of the top, for me, uh, most enjoyable, powerful, and poignant interviews I've ever been a part of. And I, and I have a feeling that a lot of other broadcasters say the same thing about you. So I'm going to go back a little bit. And by the way, if you go back, on, go on our website, check out the last interview we did with Eric. Eric, let me ask you. October 16, 2010, it's a game against uh, Army. You talked about that injury. For those who don't know, uh, it's a little bit after the 10th anniversary of that incident that obviously changed your life in so many ways. Describe the play. Yeah, I'll take you back. We're at MetLife Stadium. It had just opened up the year before, so you know we're all excited to play in that stadium. We're in the fourth quarter of the game. I had just tied it up. We were coming back. We were down, and we tied it up 17-17 to -17 with five minutes left in the fourth quarter. It's a kickoff now. And in that game, I was facing a double team, which means two guys were coming at me to block me. And on that particular play, I was able to split the double team and get the two guys behind me. I'm running down the field to make this tackle, and I said, this is going to be a big collision. I have about a 30-yard head start on this guy. I'm running full speed. He's going to be coming full speed. Do I want to use my head or do I want to use my shoulder? I said, I'm going to use my shoulder on this play, and I'm going to try to tackle him with that because I don't want to use my head. It's going to be a big collision. As my teammate got down there about a half a second before I did, he tripped the guy up. Malcolm, Malcolm Brown's body's twirled in the air. I put my head down thinking it wasn't going to be an attack at all, and the crown on my head, I ran into the back of his shoulder blade. I fractured my C3, C4 vertebrae. He fractured his collarbone, and everything was just a, a whirlwind from there. I remember, and by the way, when you talk about Malcolm who played for Army, and we'll talk about the relationship you had with him and the communication after. But I remember in that interview that you did with me, you just kept repeating that you were trying to say, I can't breathe. I do. Yes. I was on the ground. I remember the trainers coming up to me saying, Eric, is it your head or your neck? And at the time, Steve, all I could say was, I can't breathe. They go, can you feel this? Can you feel that? And I'm like, I can't breathe. From there, Coach Shiano now comes out and he looks down at me. He says, Eric, you have to pray. And you know, you can't move, you can't breathe. And now your coach is telling you, you have to pray. A lot of dark thoughts go through your mind. I thought my life was over. You know, where, where is this, where, why, why is this happening right now, like on this field? And then I said, so, you know, God, take me at ease at one point. And there's nothing to happen. I went back to panic in and you know, thank God, you know, they were lifting me up onto the cart and getting me off the field. You know, the other thing about that, is, and I remember talking to you about this, so I'm going to put this in perspective. So some of us, um, and I remember saying this to you in the interview, some of us uh, react and overreact to things. A few minutes before you got on camera, we had some technical issue, and I was irritated by it, and I complained to our producers more than I probably should have. And I remember talking to you about that then. And I asked you, where the heck did you get and how do you continue to have the most incredibly positive attitude in which you take a horrific accident mm -hmm. like this that changed your life? You were going to the NFL. Let's make it clear. Mm -hmm. You were going to the big dance and you were on everybody's shortlist. Where does your positive attitude come <clears throat> from? My whole life, I've always, I never wanted people to ever feel bad for me or I'm like, oh, poor Eric, poor this, poor that. My whole life before my injury, 
when this injury happened to me, the outcry of support that came for me was nothing just short of a miracle and just tremendous. It really goes back to show you, you know, the way you treat people when they when you're in your darkest time and you need them, if you treated them well, they'll be there for you. And none more show more than that. So now this kind of turned into all these people are, are coming up here, going out of their way to see me in a hospital at Hackensack, creating fundraisers, praying for me, going out of their way. I can't let them down. I got to fight through this. I got to stay positive. Yes, right now the prognosis is very grim, but whatever I can control, I'm going to control. And everything else I'll leave in God's hands. And it was just amazing to know that so many people were praying for me and just there for me and it just made me say, this is my responsibility now to get better. And that includes Coach Ciano, uh, at the time your coach, a nationally recognized coach who leaves. And now as we do this program in November, um, is back. What did that mean to you when Greg Ciano came back to Rutgers to coach this team? Because you had such a, you have such a tight relationship with him. It was awesome. It was, it was awesome, Steve. I mean, come on now. We needed him back. The program has just not lived up to its standards over the past few years, you know, unfortunately. You know, we've been, you know, just laughed at and not respected. And Coach Giano, I played under him. I know what he brings to the program. I know what he would do for those kids there. So when he had the opportunity to come back, like, we have to make this happen. There's no better person for a job than Coach Giano right now. <clears throat> Yeah, but that's another part of this. Beyond the X's and O's, beyond the fact that Rutgers won a game against Michigan State early on in the year, we're taping this right after, I know you don't want me to say this, the Ohio State game. L l leave it alone, Eric. Stuff happens, you know? At least, at least we did, at least Rutgers, I'm a Rutgers alum two times over, I will say. Um, two different schools at Rutgers, but I'll say this. I love when only Rutgers do you say, there's the least amount of points we lost to Ohio State. <laughs> <laughs> You got to be positive. We're from where we've been. Okay, we got to be positive. Yes, that's a lot of progress because a lot of people were thinking if that's last year, we lose that game 70 to nothing. But yeah. Coach Chiano's mindset, we're going to win every game. He don't care who's out there on the field. The number, number, you know, 300th team in the country or the number three team in the country like Ohio State. That's right. He's going out there to win, and that's how those boys played. But Eric, go back beyond the X's and O's, beyond the wins and losses. You I remember you told me at the time, and you, by the way, do you mind if I let people know, even though it's been a while, oh, yeah. is Eric's book, Believe. And uh, there's Believe Park, which we're <laughs> going to talk about in just a second. But beyond all the football stuff, Greg Ciano, what he meant to you at the most devastating time by far in your life. Talk about that. You know, Coach Ciano, when he recruited us, all of his players, he told me, when I recruit you, I treat you guys like you're my kids. The, I, all of you that have come here to Rutgers, it's my responsibility to take you from your 18-year-old self as a young boy and leave you as a 21, 22-year-old man. That's on me. And when I got hurt, there was no better way than he showed that. Coming up to the hospital, making sure I had the best care, best surgeons, best doctors. You know, those people don't under, realize in those first few days, my mom, the, the toll that it took on her staying up all day, all night with my family, to finally get, you know, get in a hotel right next to, the, next to the hospital, going there to get some sleep. To now Coach Chiano realizing I don't want to be by myself at night. I'm in a strange place. I don't know where I am or who these people are. After all day long of practicing, recruiting, all that stuff that a coach does, he would show up, up to my hospital at 11 p.m. at night and stay there until about 1 a.m., 2 a.m. in the morning just going over notes or talking to me, whatever it was, just so I didn't have to be by myself and I'd be comfortable. And there's no way to better show his character than those dark days that I was going through and him being right by my side. Hmm. It's interesting. You, that's what he did for you. That's what so many others did for you. But you have chosen to make a difference in others' lives. Talk specifically about the work that you're doing, um, particularly as it relates to spinal cord injury and those who are dealing with spinal cord injuries. Talk about Eric. Yeah, so I got opened up to a whole new world now. Of after my whole bubble was Rutgers football, class, weight room sessions, you know, football practice. You know, that's all I knew. Now this injury happens to me, and I'm like, whoa, there's actually an outside world besides what I know. And then you start to educate yourself on spinal cord injuries. You get to hear these devastating stories on how people get injured and whatnot and what they're going through. 
have some having a support system, system, some not having a support system. And you just realize how, you know, actually blessed and fortunate you are to have what you have, the people that are there for me. So let me kind of, you know, take this into a role while I'm two years into my injury. Let me think of how I can help people. Because so many people are like, Eric, how can we help? How can we help? Mm. That is when I reached out to the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation after they had been there since day right. one. I had no idea who the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation was day one. They you didn't know out. who they were. This, so here's a funny story for you, Steve. <laughs> when I, when all, back in 2012, when all these people, like I said, were reaching out to me, I said, you know what? I don't, I, like, I, I need to start something, mom. Like, like, how can we give back to people that are going through something similar as me? She goes, you know, the Christopher Dana Reed Foundation has been there since day one. I'm like, yeah, mom, I keep on hearing that name over and over again. You didn't know goes, he was Superman? So I said, I said to her, mom, who's Christopher and Dana Reed? She goes, are you kidding me? I said, no. She goes, you don't know the original Superman in the movies in the 80s and, the and, and in the 70s? I'm like, mom, I was born in 1990. I'm sorry. I don't know who he is. She goes, you got to be kidding me. So then I do my research on him. And I said, oh, probably should know who he is. And I believed in his, in his mission, him and his wife, Dana and Nicole. And I feel like that torch was passed along to me now to carry out that mission. Yeah. You know, um, the other thing is, uh, you're a motivational speaker. You're out there a lot. Who, who do you talk to and what do you say to them, Eric? I get, I, that's the thing with, with this job title of a motivational speaker, you get to talk to all different types of people. You get to talk to kids, schools, you know, with their go with and, and try to, you know, relate with them in some sort of way. Then you get to talk to corporations and businesses and CEOs on another level. So every, it's a little bit different, but the best part about it is I'm always getting to share my story of adversity and overcoming and pushing through. And no matter who you are or what age you are, we all have adversity and we all have, you know, times of doubt and, and times of, you know, the opposition that comes against us. So it relates to everybody when you can hear my story, my mm. message, and be able to share. If I'm going through a tough time, look what I'm able to do. Why can't you do the same thing? You know, Eric, we're up, 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 up against the break. I'm going to ask you to stay with us the entire time if you could, um, because there's too many things to talk about. But we're, we're doing this in November uh, of 2020 a week or so before Thanksgiving. First, I'm going to ask you about Thanksgiving, then I ask you about COVID. Thanksgiving, whether it's remote or not, means what to you? Uh, Thanksgiving is. People always ask me, do you like Thanksgiving or Christmas more? I like Christmas. I like being Santa Claus. I like giving out the gifts. But Thanksgiving food, oh my God, there's nothing like <laughs> Thanksgiving. There's nothing like Thanksgiving food. So Thanksgiving is a huge deal to myself and my family. We really enjoy the fellowship getting together and just trying to just enjoy each other and just the, everything that we truly are thankful for. Tell me about your mom. Uh, Mama Dukes, uh, keep, keeping her sane. You know, she's, you know, people ask me all the time, like, what, what does Mama Dukes do on a daily basis? I'm like, all the behind the scenes stuff that goes on of running a household, you know, when it goes to shopping, cleaning, uh, handling my medication, insurances, going on a two mile walk every day with our 138 pound Kane Corso dog. You know, yes, yeah, I have a gigantic dog. Yes, he's a biggest push. Yes, he's an Italian master for Kanye Corso. But yes, that's <laughs> what keeps her keeps her sane. And then also helping you know take care, take care, take care, take care of me. Mama Dukes is just amazing. You know, I met I met your mom. She was in the green room when uh, you came for that interview. Mm -hmm. Extraordinary woman. Um, hey, listen, when we come back from this break. I'm going to talk to you about the impact of COVID on you, the work you're doing. Also a little bit about Believe Park and some of your entrepreneurial things. And one more thing, we do a show called, uh, a sister program called Lessons in, Le Lessons in Leadership. And I wanna to talk to you a little bit about leadership. Is that okay with you? Absolutely. He is uh, Eric Legrand. Eric, see I got my Rutgers hat here? Representing in all ways, my man. I'm representing in all ways. Yeah, except I have lots of other colleges I pull in different, different hats. Well, no, we're not so gonna talk about to we're not going to talk about that today. We're just going to talk about the block R that's right there. You only have the block R because you're, you're, you're a believer, hardcore. Um, Eric Legrand, we'll be right back after this. So stay with us. To watch more One on One with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. 
Welcome back, folks. Steve Adubato with Eric Legrand. By the way, Eric is dealing with allergies, so I just want to give you a mm -hmm. heads up in case he coughs or whatever. It, they're really bothering you today, huh? It really is. I don't know what's going on. The first off, it's 79 degrees outside. The al November. I'm like, it's the November. I thought the allergies were gone. Now, all of a sudden, I'm coughing. My eyes are watering. My nose, I'm like, I hear you. What, the heck, what else is gonna happen? You know? Hey, you. Hey, you told me you have a positive attitude no matter what. You're not gonna let the I do. bother you. I'm, I'm not gonna let it. You say I'm still. I may be coughing a little bit, but I'm pushing through this. So, speaking about pushing through COVID, the impact of COVID on you and your work. Go ahead. COVID has been uh, a damper of 2020 for not only myself but millions upon millions of people, and I had a lot of stuff planned for 2020. I'm not gonna lie. We were trying to a huge campaign with the foundation to raise a million dollars for my 10 year anniversary. We had a, a bunch of stuff planned to get there and do it. That had to be pushed away. I had multiple speaking engagements lined up for month after month after month. Couldn't do those, couldn't go there. So it definitely affected my pocket in, you know, in, in some sort of fashion. And then also some other, some other events that I had you know, planned. But I will say, honestly, Steve, with COVID, it allowed me to take, take a step back and reflect and honestly, I started getting into audio books, started reading it then. It's been, it's, it's been my mind in a positive direction, which I'm going to start talking to you guys about in a little bit. So I wouldn't let it just knock everything down. We'll, we'll do that because, again, this will be seen in 2021 as well. So I'm curious about this. For those who are, and there are a lot of folks, uh, we have teenage boys who are like, I can't do this anymore. I can't, the remote thing is just killing me. And not just my kids, but millions of people across this country, people in our region watching this show who are saying, I can't, I just can't do this anymore. Give them a message. Talk to them, Eric Legrand. Stay on the task. I and mean, obviously this is not a task that we ask for. Stay disciplined, stay hard. Think, now don't only think about yourself, think about the other people because no, always remember this, no matter how bad your situation may be, not being able to go to school, not being able to go to work, not being able to do this, not being able to do that there's always someone that has it worse than you. Remember that. I have only been out probably since March 11th, 10 to 15 times in all these months. So just imagine I'm stuck upstairs in my room because I have secondary complications because of spinal cord injuries, but I'm staying fo focused on the task and I'm staying positive. I won't let COVID get to me. I'm being smart. I'm not going around a bunch of people. But other people, I know we have things that we have to do. We want to live our lives. I understand that. Hmm. But we also have to look at the bigger picture here. If we can get through this and get, get it just out of our system, we'll be able to go back to that life again very soon. You just helped a lot of people. Uh, hey, Eric, do this. Uh, I told you before, I'm a student of leadership. I've written about it. I teach it, coach it, make mistakes all the time as a leader. Our program, Lessons in Leadership, with uh, my colleague, Mary Gamba, we look at it all the time. How would you... What would you say the keys to great leadership are? Keys to leadership is allowing to step back, formulate a plan around a situation, listen to opinions of the people that are closest to you, and then go execute those plans. Stuff is going to be thrown your way with this and that, this and that. How do I help these people? How do I help these other people over here? You have to take, like I said, take a step back, actually see what's going on, formulate that plan on how you can help each individual, them being able to make that decision and staying firm in that decision and executing that plan and leading by example. Not everyone is always, you know, as in football, we always say the loud hoop, rah, yelling and cheering. Mm. Some people just come in each and every day and they go to work and they stay consistent in their work each and every day. And people start to gravitate towards that and having a positive mindset to be able to lift up the people around you and inspire them. Hey, stay on, stay on sports for a second. I often say in my seminars on my coaching around leadership, I use football analogies. Um, I say sometimes you have to call an audible. You have a play designed. You know it's going to work, but you look at the defense. It's set up differently. You're a sports analyst. By the way, let everybody know your uh, credentials as a broadcaster, please. Yeah, I, I do the Rutgers football games. I'm on the air with Chris Carlin, Ray Lucas. I work with Big Ten Network, Sirius XM, and ESPN Radio. Just want to check that out. So, hey, ready? You got to call an audible because the defense is set up a certain way. You're not going to go with that play. What does that have to do with leadership? If I say you got to be agile, I call it strategically agile. You got to call an audible. What does that mean to you? Preparation. Setting up for all things that could be, all the possibilities of things that could happen. 
yes, they, you may not sometimes be prepared for, oh, they, they threw this at us. Got to hit this hard. Okay, how do we formulate a plan to attack against that? When you look at the defense, they come out there, they prepare too. Hmm. They know your tendencies. They know what's going on. How do you shift? Okay, they want to do this. Watch. Watch me fake them with this screen. Watch me fake them with that. Preparation creates luck. People always say, oh, he got lucky. No, he was prepared. They were prepared. You were prepared for a certain situation, and that's how you got to look at it. And that includes, includes uh, technical things that go wrong, um, contingencies. If that, that, But here's the problem, Eric. You can't figure out everything that can go wrong. So what do you do? When, uh, when you can't figure out everything that goes wrong, you have to be able to absorb a blow and then pivot. Pivot to the next thing. I have a great example for that. My 10th no. annual walk to believe this year. We were supposed to have it at Rutgers like we always do. My 5K, run, walk, roll. It was going to be at night with a glow stick run, fireworks, all this stuff. COVID comes. Can't have a gathering. Thousand people. We, we're not allowed to do that. What do we do? We pivot. We make it a virtual 5K run where people can do it in their own towns, in their own time, with them, you know, socially distanced from everybody. And we end up getting all participants from 50 states, two U.S. territories, and 10 countries. And we've raised, we raised $190,000 more than we ever did before in our lives during COVID. Yes. You know what, Eric, if you don't mind, Eric, I'm writing a book on leadership and innovation mm -hmm. in the age of COVID with my colleague, Mary Gamm. Would you mind if we include something about that? I know you're not going to say no because you love Absolutely. publicity and branding. Absolutely. Yeah. Man. We, <laughs> we did that, man. We did it still. I'm, I'm very happy. To, I'm very proud to see what we were doing. <laughs> All in a month and a half time. Left. You got two minutes left. Um, do the entrepreneurial stuff. You got a coffee shop? What are we talking about? So COVID allowed me to go into my entrepreneurship mindset and in summer of 2020, I'm, I'm proud to announce that the Grand Coffee House will be coming to my hometown of Warbridge, New Jersey. And then the new year, starting in January slash February, we're going to open up our own online shop and go national. So I got some good stuff brewing for you guys. I believe you're going to want to try 85% of the world drinks coffee. Try some of this La Grand Coffee. It might change your life. Your you're always thinking, give me 30 day. seconds on Believe Park. Believe, believe. Believe Park, you said? Yeah. My park in my hometown. Oh, man. It's just special. I grew up there as a kid, played so many sports, got in trouble there. Got had it just it grew it grew me into the person I am today. To have a park that is in my hometown named after me, the Eric Legrand, Eric Legrand Believe Park, it's just something special. Okay, so here's the deal. Um, you won the Jimmy V Award, you know, for the great Jimmy Valvano for persistence, excuse me, perseverance in 2012, the SB Awards. You've won every award, you're in the Hall of Fame. 2020 Rutgers Athletic Hall of Fame. What is left for Eric Legrand to accomplish? 30 seconds, go. The biggest left for me to accomplish is getting back on my feet, walking again, and inspiring as many people as I can along the way. The job is still not done. Oh, the awards are great. The accolades are great. But until I'm up out of this wheelchair and the 5.6 million people that are dealing with some sort of paralysis have hope and belief that they can go back to live that able-bodied life, the job is not done. And you have no doubt, you believe <laughs> that believe it's going to happen. I believe each and every day. We're, we've come into 10 years I've been injured. Who knows what we'll be in the next 10 years, 20 years. It's going to be something special. Hey, Eric, um, I'm honored, <clears throat> even though we're remote, to have you with us, to once again be able to interview you, whether you're in person or remote on Zoom. You're not just a great interview. You're uh, just an amazing human being, and you honor us um, by being with us. Wish you all the best, you and your mom and your family. Um, take care. You have an open invitation at any time. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate it, Steve. Thank you for having me. You got it. I'm Steve Adubato. That's Eric Legrand. He's amazing. You got to believe. See you next time. One-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by the Turrell Fund, supporting Reimagine Child Care, PNC, Grow Up Great, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Northward Center, the Russell Berry Foundation, ADP, Fedway Associates, Inc., and by the Fidelco Group. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Family Magazine and by CIANJ and Commerce Magazine.
The essence of the North Ward Center is ingrained in our values, thoughts, and actions. What began as a storefront on Bloomfield Avenue has evolved into a life-changing community nonprofit. The mansion is steeped in tradition, but with all of its grandeur, the true essence of the North Ward Center is in the people we serve. So as the North Ward Center commemorates 50 years of service, let's also celebrate the many opportunities yet to come.